and uh, ask the colleagues from the ESRB who have the microphones to uh, pass them on. I would say Richard has his hands up. Um, um, I see Adrian and um, afterwards Francesco, please. Thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, I, well, first of all, the link between banks and shadow banks, uh, they're not linked anymore, you know? Shadow banking has been transformed into resilient market-based finance. Didn't we all know that now? Um, anyway, sorry, I'm being, I'm being a little bit difficult. Uh, but um, where I want to be positive is on Stein's smell test. Um, I, like, I like the smell test idea. Um, and it's not, just, uh, it's not just looking for implicit backstops. Um, I give you another clue, if you like, and that is the relationship between risk and return. We, um, you know, we regard that as something fundamental in finance. Uh, and regulation tends to reduce risk. That's the part of the point. And, of course, reduces return. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, of that relationship and the s where the spell test should have operated and did not was AIG, AIG's uh, CDS market activities uh, in the period leading up to the crisis. The, there's this small London office, 20 people or so, producing a very large revenue stream. Nobody in New York on the board uh, or in the management seemed to have noticed that, um, you know, that this was a very profitable activity. What was going on that was so profitable, right? Well, the answer is that they were taking huge risks. Uh, uh, and um, that's a, and it, that was a shadow banking activity uh, par, uh, par excellence. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that if that, that, that we might add that criterion, as it were, to your smell test uh, uh, toolkit. Do you want to respond directly? No, no, I, I would agree, agree completely. I mean, the market discipline doesn't always work, uh, and there are some obvious signs for sure exposed, but even ex ante. Uh, I would even take it broad. I mean, we don't necessarily always try to make the market discipline the system, right? And, and we know there is a volatility paradox, et cetera, but we could, through some uh, data provision, for sure, help the market better discipline, I would hope. Uh, we could also just think of some structures, mutual insurance. I mean, if you go back uh, centuries ago, there was a lot more mutual operations in terms of clearing houses and what have you that exercised quite a bit of discipline in the system. We've done away with that and we've, we've re replaced it largely by the state, so back to the backstop. Uh, but we have to introduce that to some degree because we're never going to be fighting this war and winning it if we keep relying on the regulators to do this. Uh, we have to al allow the market to do a little bit better. And that goes back to the data. We don't necessarily provide analytically useful data for the market to identify these risks. Uh, and we're always hiding behind, oh, it's confidentiality and what have you. But at some point, we have to stop uh, saying that argument because we're not going to win, uh, win the war this way. Yeah. Ajay. Yeah, I just, I have a comment on the modeling. So um, I think in the general equilibrium exercise, you want to think about additional frictions as well, like behavioral biases, like neglected risk or contractual incompleteness. I think that, you know, shadow banking per se might not be dangerous, but if it's, if it's combined with, um, you know, things like um, biases and ratings, um, um, you know, accounting ways of, of hiding risks or behavioral biases that drive up asset valuations above fundamentals. You know, it's, it's that combination that makes it uh, um, dangerous in the aggregate. Um, so it might be useful to study that. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, definitely. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Now, next one is Francesco. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I remember the days when, when we started the, the, this institution. At that time, we were all reading the, the, the papers of Gorton saying that basically the crisis has been a, a, a run on, on, shadow, on shadow banks. And um, we were mostly into worried about money market funds. It's been one of the first recommendations we have been issued. Then, at a certain time, a new phase came in which people were saying, well, you know, it is very 
uh, impolite to call these people shadow banks because it's, uh, it's almost a terminology which is uh, negative, we should call market finance. And now if we will understand basically the thrust of the discussion is that you can continue to call them shadow banks because they are not dangerous. Now, what I'm asking myself, and, and, and if any, the things which you have to do is an empirical work to look at the numbers, but uh, at least in, li in a line of principle, more shadow banking is better because it is less, uh, less, uh, less dangerous than banks. So I, I would like to ask then the question, which is to a certain extent uh, a question I've asked myself also in terms of uh, um, pol policy work. Does it mean that systemic risk is originated only from banks? I guess, Janis, this goes uh, right directly to you. Well, I mean, depends. I mean, of course, not always, right? And in the US, certainly not. Um, but it just goes at the heart, and then it goes also to what Tobias said. I mean, it's not, um, so how current, uh, modeling frameworks uh, haven't agreed upon uh, yet uh, a consistent behavior framework that would encompass all those um, issues that Tobias was talking about. So this is hard to model and therefore um, if you do just the regular frictions uh, that can cause excessive risk taking, you will conclude uh, that shadow banks may not, uh, an increase in those shadow bank activity may not be as harmful. But I'm not saying at all, I mean, uh, that's my personal view because I'm very aware, aware of those other <laughs> features and I'm thinking it's very important and we need to study and we need to understand this much better. And uh, as a consequence, as we know, the, the um, risk may emit from many other institutions as well, not just <laughs> uh, traditional banks. That clarification was a great relief, I think, to many people here in this room who dedicate their lives to understanding the system. There is a risk, so there are risks. There may be risks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I think uh, David uh, was uh, also interested in asking a question. If I take the BIS data, so global GDP, 85 trillion, Banking assets, 160 trillion, so two times global GDP. Equity, it's five trillion. Um, so basically we have a system that is extremely highly geared. Uh, the losses incurred in the systemic risk is only a function of one thing, leverage and gearing. Because what you thought was safe, Greek bonds, Argentinian bonds, AAA mortgages, you have it in massive amount, and that's what kills you. Anything that you deem risky, equity, shadow banking, because you can have so little, it never kills you. So the question I ask the panel, when you say risk today, um, is the shadow banking system leveraged or not? Because I live in it, and I have 400 of equity, 85 of risk, okay? And when I look at any banking or any insurance, they run between 15 and 20 times leverage. So I ask myself, is the leverage in the shadow banking um, such a risk? Because operationally, we don't see it. And for the simple reason, because we are forced to invest in anything that is risky. Because if it's not risky, someone comes with zero financing from the ECB or the Fed, and then of course they can win, just maths. And so I'm asking your question, you know, if you're so worried about the shadow and not actually what is AAA which is what worries me the most, because then someone wakes up, uh, you know, Korea, Lehman, Greece. Stan, you want to uh, So David, uh, you may well be in a segment of the industry that I wouldn't call shadow banking for that reason, because you, you're lowly leveraged, you're doing intermediation that doesn't uh, pass my smell test uh, because you're uh, well covered. So. And in that sense, the regulation should be proportionate. Uh, it's largely disclosure, and the rest is up to you and your shareholders, investors, uh, to worry uh, in, a, in a governance sense. Uh, so that that goes back to the definition. Yes, we have to be careful about what we define shadow banking and how we apply the regulation accordingly. So there are some commands that shouldn't be there. Having said that, your interactions with other com parts of the financial system, not you per personally, but that part of the industry, could create pro-cyclicality that should be a concern to us because 
uh, again, we can get uh, an overall uh, bad outcome. Um, uh, there the toolkit is a little harder to apply, so I'm not yet ready to say, okay, we're gonna now regulate that part in the following way, uh, but nevertheless, we should be, uh, be wary about it. Yeah. And certainly, if I can say a word about it, um, leverage in any of those entities is of um, central interest to us when coordinating and, and, and defining our anal analytical work, and I'm speaking here for the ESRB, for FRESMA, for other institutions involved. It is uh, the core identifying um, element for, for our risk analytical work, both at a monitoring level, but also for individual studies. And to give you just an example, we are concretely looking at leverage in uh, hedge funds, for example. Um, and that brings us, just to say that, uh, at a number of uh, very interesting uh, problems. I mean, first of all, we need to differentiate between conventional financial leverage on the one hand, and then synthetic leverage through the use of derivatives, for example, we have a European regulatory system where leverage is not, un not un in a unified way defined across entities. So we have, we're dealing with different definitions of uh, technical definitions of leverage, even if we as analysts have a joint view of what it is, technically speaking, it is different for different entities and so on. Uh, and then on top of that comes the data question. I think that has been highlighted by uh, all three of our panelists, Stephen, Juliana, and Stain, that uh, yes, the data are becoming available, but it just will take a lot of time to, to become as routine uh, and as, um, uh, as, as perfectionist as our banking supervisory colleagues and the central bankers are in, the, in, in monitoring the banking system. So it is for us a, a real central concern. Um, I see no more um, direct uh, hands up in the audience, but let me therefore ask a closing question to the panel, and this is a more, like a, a more popular sort of question, maybe each individually. What do you think is the most pressing risk at this stage in the shadow banking system? And I will start maybe in reverse order with Stein and then Stephen and then Julian. This is this is too loaded a question. That's yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> it's bad. Uh, this is. Uh, um, I, I'm I'm gonna cop out on this one. Uh, so uh, I think we c we have to keep monitoring things on, on a regular basis. Uh, it's very difficult to tell this. I think we have a situation in which we have elevated asset prices around the world. Uh, there's a lot of. Um, uh, disconnect between what we see in terms of the financial markets of volatility and what we see in terms of the policy uncertainty. Uh, so uh, as a general observation, I would say we should be uh, wary. Uh, at the BS has always been wary, so it's sometimes uh, the crying wolf, uh, but I think this is a particular time when that may be a good thing to do. Stephen. Yeah, let me, let me pass this question because I, 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 uh, I'm waiting for the data. So. <laughs> Yeah, waiting for the data too? No, you've got some. I, n well, no, I can reiterate what I had said before, that I mean, I also would wait for the data where actually it, it, uh, it shows itself, but I think conceptually it's anywhere where those behavioral um, aspects can come into play. So where, what are the uh, assets or constellation where risk may, um, where we think we are safe? <laughs> so the wrong belief of being safe is typically what triggers um, the, the problem. So availability of data is a determining factor in uh, this game. Uh, I think that is one major takeaway from this discussion. Um, we know that more will be coming, so maybe it is both things, having more data and also having the capacities and the resources to actually tackling them that will be important going forward. I also take it from, uh, from, from your uh, findings and, and what you said that the definitional question remains acute just because it is a moving target. It remains a mutating, uh, uh, a mutating concept, in not least in light of financial innovation, correct? And uh, that will need to remain active and, and agile about uh, exactly understanding what shadow banking is and how we define it. Um, and that, in turn, is important for us to identify the main risks that we actually want to get our heads around um, and the items that we have uh, uh, tackled today was, in particular, uh, the risk of arbitrage from within the banking sector, outside the banking sector, and we've seen some very interesting insights both from Juliane and from Stephen. 
um, and in addition also questions of uh, leverage and liquidity in the system and the interconnectedness of, uh, of those entities, both in our own jurisdictions, but also then in international connection. With that, let me thank Juliane and Stephen and Stein for the great presentations, for the great discussion. Thank you very much. And also to the audience for the active involvement. Thank you.